Good morning, folks. Let's stand, if we may, please, and go to 427. All right, 427. And we're going to sing real loud for a few minutes, if we may, please. 427, the sweet by and by. Let's all sing together, all right, 427. There's a land that is fairer than day, and by faith we can see it afar. For the Father waits over the way to prepare us a dwelling place there in the sweet by and by we shall meet on that beautiful shore in the sweet by and by we shall meet on that beautiful shore we shall sing on that beautiful shore the melodious songs of the blessed and our spirits shall sorrow no more not a sigh for the blessing of rest in the sweet by and by we shall meet on that beautiful shore in the sweet by and by we shall meet on that beautiful shore to our bountiful father above we will offer our tribute of praise for the glorious gift of his love and the blessing that hallow our days in the sweet by and by we shall meet on that beautiful shore in the sweet by and by we shall meet on that beautiful shore very good folks we welcome you this evening and we have a lot to pray about in these next few minutes a lot of folks we need to be praying for and we have uh, folks that are dealing with things across the spectrum in our church family. We have a responsibility to be what God has asked us to be for those folks. And so we're going to go to the Lord in prayer and ask God to help us. Uh, we are glad to say that for at least the next half hour, 45 minutes, our boiler is working. And uh, we'll see. We think we have some ideas. Just to give you a, a little bit of an update on that, we had a severe incident about two and a half years ago and then two years ago we had started with a brand new full replacement and we did several things that were directed by the number one boiler company in the state of Ohio um, and two years later we have the exact same problem we had before so that's all right we've got Danny Smith on it now and we'll be fine okay so if you're ever too cold even in the summer blame him no. I appreciate him. He was here with the folks from Campbell's getting things back up and operational. And we do hope, we think we have some ideas to get some things long-term fixed, and so I hope we can. And so some, some investment needs to be made, I think, but God willing, we'll meet that need there, okay? But we're going to go to the Lord in prayer, and let's, let's be a church, okay? Lord, we come to you, and I do ask that you will bless our time. We have church family that is in need. We have church family with heavy hearts. And Lord, I ask in the name of your son that we can be a church, a real church, not a religious social organization, but a real church to people. And then Lord, beyond that, I pray that those who are burdened can know a real Savior, know a real faith, and a real relationship with God. Lord, guide our time here in Jesus' name. Amen. 102, if you would, please. 102, and we're going to sing this, Born to Die Upon Calvary. And let's sing our part here. How are you familiar with uh, Patch the Pirate, Ron Hamilton? I don't know if you followed a little bit of his situation on Bookface. We ought to pray for his family. He 
many years ago started Patch the Pirate and then worked with Garlocks and Majesty Music and had a great impact on many generations of young people and churches. And several years ago, he was diagnosed with a fairly aggressive form of dementia. And it has basically reduced him to a child and a man that God has used in such a great way. And they said that every emotional response, whatever the emotion may be, he responds with laughter. And so if somebody gives him sad news, tells him if someone's going to be with the Lord or something, he responds with laughter. And his wife said, I, I wish we could all learn to respond to all circumstances with a merry spirit rather than just letting every event tear us down. And so, but uh, this song was written by him and God used it. And we're gonna sing this chorus, okay? Born to die on Calvary, Jesus suffered my sin to forgive. And let's all sing it together, all right? The chorus, one under two. Born to die upon Calvary, Jesus suffered my sin to forgive. Born to die upon Calvary, He was wounded that I might live once more. Born to die upon Calvary, Jesus suffered my sin to forgive. Born to die upon Calvary, He was wounded that I might live. Very good, you may be seated. And I thank you very much, Dr. Bennett, before you get down, come on up and lead us in prayer if you would. And you know, we've, we've not passed an offering plate and I, it may be a little bit to our hurt that we've not done that in some areas. Um, let's not forget that in November, we start receiving our camp offering. And so we really hadn't made much mention of that. The offering boxes are still back there and available. We are still collecting that money for camp. And we have full intention of being able to have camp in 2021. And so I hope and pray that's the case. But remember that offering. Let's, let's try to get back in that habit now. And we collect that money and we put those things back and we help to send young people to camp. You know, what we do, we charge the young people in our church $20 for the, a person for the whole week for all their meals and all the games and all the, all the things that we do. And then all of our uh, folks from outside, they're $50. And so what, that, what the offering we receive now does goes to cover the expenses for all the young people in our church as much as we can. And so um, remember that offering. And so that offering box is still back there. We can receive that. And let's all pray together, okay? God, God we thank you that you are the God of all comfort and you can comfort each of us in times of need. And Lord, our hearts go out to those of our number tonight that are mourning the loss of the loved ones, and we just pray that you'd be especially near to them, help them to know that we love them and care for them and support them, and Lord, help us to be an encouragement to them, and just uh, be with Sherry and her family, and with Mac and Melinda and the rest of the family there, Lord, help them to sense your presence and to have the strength they need to carry out through these times. Lord, we just pray for our country tonight and many things that are going on there that you'd have your way in that and that hearts would be changed and people would be uh, obedient to your wishes and that they'd follow your guide and that we'd see our country blessed because of honoring you. Amen. Lord, just uh, be with our church, bless the ministries here and the pastor and all of us who attend and help us, Lord, to be a caring church and a church that you could be proud of and used. And Lord, just uh, help us to grow closer to you and help us to listen to your word tonight. Pray you give us, give us the message we need and help us to carry it from here to make us more like you. Bless the offering and help it to be sufficient for the needs and 
to be used in ways that would be pleasing to you. And we just pray you'd be with the youth group downstairs and help them, Lord, to be encouraged and to be taught ways that they need to go. And, Lord, may they follow your leading in their lives and may this be a means of you using the word to to strengthen and help them. Lord, just uh, have your way in every part of the service and, and uh, be glorified here tonight. And we thank you for it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, let's take our prayer bullet and let's sing this chorus on the back, if we may. You know, the longer you live, the more the, the Christian life, the more you begin to appreciate being a part of the family of God. And I'm so glad I'm a part of the family of God. What it means to have a church family, but more importantly, to know you have a heavenly father. Let's sing this together, all right. The family of God, let's sing our best, all right. I'm so glad I'm a part of the family of God. I've been washed in the fountain, cleansed by his blood. Joint heirs with Jesus as we travel this sod. For I'm part of the family, the family of God. Very good. Let's look here to the back. We may pray for the martyrs. Christians in the state of, you pronounce it best you can, faced a tough time since coronavirus restrictions were placed in India. They're still not allowed to meet, is my understanding, not allowed to meet. They face four main challenges. They're not allowed to farm, which is their main source of income. They live in ongoing fear of social excommunication. They are prohibited from using communal wells, and their Christian activities are closely monitored. Villages where there are three or fewer Christian families impose strict guidelines on the Christians if they perform any Christian activity in their house will be excommunicated and their land and property will be taken away. For this reason, Christian families sometimes limit church attendance to once a month, walking great distances to attend. Pray for these families at this time. Think about that. I just, it's stunning what they go through. Our ministry this week is because of Calvary Radio and our family are Darren and Wendy Rollins. And so be praying for them. Our elected official this week is our Scioto County Commissioner, Kathy Coleman. And pray for also the soon coming replacement. Mike Crabtree, as you know, was saved, fortunately, before he went to be with the Lord. but has now passed away. And he had yet to be sworn in to his newly elected term. And a man called me today and was asking me, he was thinking about putting his name in the hat. And he said, he said, what do you think? He said, give me a little counsel. And I said, well, I said, I think you ought to go ahead and do it. I said, all I can do is tell you no, you know. And so pray for that situation and pray for Kathy Coleman and the folks there, okay? Pray for our missionaries, Jonathan and Lindsay McClure. They are still having to live stream only their services. And so pray for them. England is rolling out the vaccine for coronavirus and pray as that does roll out that it, that it is effective. Now I know many people are very trepidatious about using it and taking it, um, but at the same time, we want it to work, you know, we want it to work. And so um, pray that countries like this can see the, the fruit of all that, okay? And then we have a list of things that are very heavy on each heart. And as of 9 o'clock last night, Jennifer Questenberry went to be with the Lord. And please be praying for Mac, Wes and Melinda, Shane and McKenna. And there are a lot of adjustments that need to be made. Now I'm sure their hearts are very heavy. But I made this statement to them. I said, the reality is her faith became sight. And, and so we're grateful for that. Funeral will be one o'clock here in this auditorium with visitation from 11 to one. 
and uh, be praying for family. If you're able to come, that'll be the time, and be sure to visit. Uh, now, this is being done through the folks at Ralph Scott, and so they will be in charge of this, that we are a venue for that, and so they have the requirement that mask must be worn, so we will be honoring that. So in that service, we will have folks in mask, okay? And that's an expectation on their end, and we're gonna abide by those things. And so, but to be praying for them, and um, you know, pray, pray for Shane and McKenna. Um, how many of you were young when you had a grandfather or grandmother pass away? You were young. I was two years old when a grandfather died. I was eight years old when another grandfather died. Two years old, I didn't remember. Eight, eight years old, I remember a lot of things. And there were things that my parents told me. I remember my brother telling me. I don't know why he told me this at the, at, in this time. He told me that my grandfather had died in a plane crash when I was eight years old. And he told me in my mom and dad's bathroom. I don't know why he chose that location, but he took, he went in there and, and I remember him telling me, it's okay to cry. I remember him telling me that, it's okay to cry. It's okay to be sad. And that's when it hit me and I was sad. And then, you know, I knew my grandfather was with the Lord and there were moments and uh, I was 17 when my, or, 18 when my grandmother died and then 25 when my other grandmother died and so you know you can you digest things differently as an adult versus a child so pray for Shane and McKenna and uh, pray for Mac pray for them as they adjust here and then just this evening about four o'clock is my understanding uh, Sherry Bishop's grandfather went to be with the Lord Suddenly, he fell over. I would suspect a heart attack. I'm not giving a diagnosis on that. I spoke with Sherry and um, pray for her, pray for Jimmy, pray for Chanson and Creighton. This is her dad's dad. Now that's compounded because this is her dad just had to bury his own wife and now his father and so this is all just in the course of a few days and so pray for that family if you would and this will be their third funeral in 14 days and pray that God will help them and you see the address is there and I've asked you this from time to time but why do you think we put these addresses in here because it helps when you send them a note let them, let them know that you're praying for them. I received a card this week, uh, today I actually opened the card and um, my wife and I were the alumni of the week at Crown and they have, I don't know, five or 6,000 alumni, but somehow we end up being alumni once a year, alumni of the week. So out of 50, we end up working our way in there about every year. And a lady that knew us and her son had spoke at our church. She sent me a note and just wanted to let you know that you're a, our alumni and we prayed for you this week. I opened that card and, and we were very encouraged by that. And I know that people are encouraged if you send them a note and just say, we're praying for you. That's enough. And then also, and I, don't, I do not know how public this is. And so um, I'm going to be very cautious about this, but a teacher that all three of my boys have had at Wheelersburg has been going through cancer treatments and, and been very sick uh, over the last several years. And we received a text message that she had become very gravely ill. And then right before church, my understanding is, is that she had passed away. And so I know teachers and schools try to offer some help to kids as they deal with teachers that have passed away, um, but they're all online, they're all home. And so I just pray for those teachers. I know she was very important to Elijah. She was a quiz bowl teacher and um, she liked Elijah. 
because he was a lot like his father, you know. But uh, so we had a good relationship there with him. But, um, but pray, for the, pray for them, if you would, the teachers there. I'm not going to give the name because I've not seen it made public yet. And so pray for them, if you would. Also, this is from Dawn Walker. I pray for Roger Davis, Doug and Melissa Davis. Their dad was taken to SMC with a stroke and um, brain something. Meds? Mets. Okay. Okay. So pray for this family, Roger Davis and Doug and Melissa Davis. And pray for them if you would, okay? Any other things that we need to mention? And I was talking to Cassie. She said, it seems like everybody's dealing with death. And I told them, and some of the teens were in the office, I said, you know what you do when it seems like there's death and heartache all around you? You focus on the living. You focus on those people that God has allowed you to have a continued relationship with. And it should make those moments matter even more. It should make them more special. It should make us more attentive. Because we do not know how quickly these things can pass. When you think about it, we had record-breaking piano player Sunday, kids singing in the church, and Jennifer played for them that Sunday. Tuesday, she's sick. Friday, she's on a helicopter going to Columbus. And as of yesterday, she's with the Lord. Time is so fleeting, and we have to measure the moments in which we spend with those who are living. And so pray for these families, that God will help them. All right. Any other things before we go to the Lord in prayer? Yes. Blevins. Right. Also, and thank you for bringing up Oliver Road. Pray for Kyra Noel. Kyra, K-Y-R-A, Noel. This is the wife of Pastor Don Noel. Now, they've been going back and forth. She was very sick for two years. And then he's been diagnosed with cancer, has just undergone his last cancer treatment a few weeks ago waiting for those, that follow-up result meeting. She was just diagnosed with a blood disease, cancer-like uh, diagnosis. It is not leukemia, but they've made the statement that when you are diagnosed with this, that they give you about two years at most to live. And so pray for Kyra, no, if you would, very importantly, okay? If there's no others, we'll go to the Lord in prayer. Yes, an unspoken request from Grandma Peapine. All right, pray that God will work there, okay? Very good. Any other things? All right, well, let's find someone to pray with, and I'll come and close here in just a moment, all right? Let's pray together, maybe.
Lord, we come to you and we ask for the blessings of heaven poured out on heavy hearts. Lord, if we're not careful, we can look at times like this as defeating, discouraging. But Lord, we spoke of people that have gone to be with the Lord, that are absent from the body and present with the Lord. Lord, there may be sorrow here, but we know there's rejoicing in eternity. Lord, we ask you in the name of your Son, encourage each spirit, pray for those names that we've listed. Let them know your help in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, let's look here if we may. There are a couple of three or four events that I'd like to, to mention. One is these little invitations are back at the usher's table. And these are for the Christmas according to Calvary. Okay. Now, Heidi is down there working, trying to get the same kids in the same room at the same time to figure out who's going to be what part. And so she had all the innkeepers, the shepherds, and the angels, and everything lined up. And then we bring some kids forget to come. And I heard her downstairs a little bit ago, walking up to one boy that just started coming. She said, so what are you feeling today? You an innkeeper? You a shepherd? What are you feeling like? And he said, shepherd. And I said, oh, no, you are an innkeeper. And she said, and he said, no, I'm a shepherd. <laughs> All right, at least he's secure in who he is. And so, but uh, pray for these young people. This is coming up. Now we have a, a series of events that are kind of leading into it. You can take that and give it to somebody and invite them uh, to be a part of it. Now, one thing I want you to point out, whenever we invite somebody to our church, invite them with the understanding that our auditorium is bigger than a basketball gym, okay? They are not going to be sitting on each other's laps. So we have room to spread out. They can have distance. They can be comfortable in that situation, okay? Now, we were talking, to, I was talking to some folks at, at funeral homes today, and they said people are just not going to funerals. They're not doing those things. They're scared to get out. And we're going to do our best under those circumstances. And we still want to get the gospel out. We still want to be an encouragement to as many families as God would allow us to, okay? And so, please remember, if you would, uh, to pray for this event. Now, the young people are going to practice on the 19th, and that's not in the bulletin. So they're going to practice on the 19th, and I believe we start at 11 o'clock. We have pizza, and then we take them out to the Christmas cave. I've been watching pictures of the Christmas cave, and that attendance is dropped precipitously, okay? And people are just not getting out and doing things except going to the outlet malls. Um, but I've even understood that places like the Huntington Mall and things like that are very limited. And so much smaller groups. And so uh, we're going to do our best. We want to encourage these families. We have cookies out there for cookie sign up. Uh, we can take care of that. All right. Um, but that's one big event that we have coming up. And so that's our, our church. Maybe some of you have never been to the Christmas cave. Uh, our church goes out there. And so we can all meet out there, go through it one time. We kind of need the help because every now and again we need, we need somebody to be on lead ropes, leashes, lassos. Uh, maybe if you're real good at Roman Greco wrestling, uh, there are a few times we need to wrestle a kid to the ground and all that good stuff, okay? So uh, keep that in mind. Uh, but that we're, we're out there at 3.30 and we're trying to be the first people in at 4 o'clock. And so pray that God will help us there and we can get all those things cared for. Also, this Sunday, our missionary Larry Fogel is going to be with us. And here's what I'm going to do. I have two books of his that he's written. And we're going to have everybody that's here Sunday night, we're going to give two of those books out. Okay? So we're going to draw names and we're going to give out those books. Okay? So everybody's here. We're going to have you fill out, put your name on a piece of paper, put it in a basket. We're going to draw those out. We're going to give you a book. 
Okay? And so I think one of them is elephant trunk steaks and uh, anteater pie or something like that. Just things from his experiences. What's that? Termite meatloaf. That's what it is. And so that's just from his adventures in Africa. We're going to give some of those away Sunday night. We want to be an encouragement to them. Of course, you know, we'll be receiving a love offering for them. They've been missionaries of ours for decades, since the 70s. And I'll be praying for them, if you would. But they'll be with us Sunday night. And then next Wednesday. What time does church start next Wednesday? Six, is that a.m. or p.m.? Are you sure? Okay, you kind of look like you were sure there for a minute. All right, 6 p.m. Are we going to eat that night? We're going to have a lot of space. We're going to spread out. Yeah, we're going to spread out. And we're going to put together the Christmas ornaments. Okay? And we're going to do this like our Christmas caroling. Now, we're still debating exactly what's going to happen with kids and all that because we may send them to the gym and have them practice and, and send them home. I don't know exactly what's going to happen, but we'll figure all those details out. But we're going to meet at 6 o'clock. We're going to have food and we're going to put together these ornaments with the gospel track on them and, and the Calvary logo. And then we're going to take them to our neighbors. And so we're working to that end, okay? And so uh, pray that God will give favor with that, if you would. A man today spoke with me and he said, how do you know? He said, how is your church done in all this? I said, I believe our church has done very well. Our people have responded well and our church has stayed faithful and and they've gotten back to work in the ministry. And, and uh, he said, well, I saw that you had billboards up. I said, yes, if you can't knock on somebody's door, we figured we'd at least put billboards up, you know. And I'd like to, I've received some locations for doing a 2021 project as well. And, and so we're working on those things. But pray that God will give our church favor in all this. That God will help us. And that somebody will take that Christmas ornament and say, wasn't that nice? That church gave such a nice gift. And they read the card and they read how to trust Christ as Savior. And they walk into this auditorium and they hear the gospel and they trust Christ as their Savior. That'd be a good thing, wouldn't it? Pray that God can make those things happen. And then the 23rd, we have our Christmas candlelight service. And that's that Wednesday night. Everything's here in the auditorium. And, and we will have our candlelight service. I, I ask people to be ready to sing. And we usually don't have much time to prepare and get people in, on board and engaged with all that. And so I just say, be ready. So you got that, Rod? I need you to be ready. They're ready. How many of you, after all these years, you'd like to hear Rod Walker do a special just one time? Say amen. amen. Just one time. We had hands go up. We went Pentecostal for a minute. Amen. That's right. They want it. That's how you got Karen. I know it. You're nobody this song, but I loves you. That's right. That's right. Oh, that wasn't very nice. Well, you know the things we need to pray about. Pray for these events that God will use them for such a time as this, okay? Let's pray together, may we? Lord, we come to you and know that we have things that are before us. But we also have things that are against us. Help us to rise above it all, Lord. See your hand at work in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Acts chapter 15, if you would please. Acts chapter 15. 
Give me a quick assessment while you're turning there. How many of you are currently uh, a little warm? How many of you are cool? How many of you are just right? Huh, I'm burning up. All right, so Acts chapter 15, and we're going to begin in verse number 6 and skip over several verses for sake of time. But the Bible says in Acts 15, verse 6, the apostles and elders came together for to consider of this matter. Now, if you'll remember, they are, the matter they are considering is whether salvation is by works or by faith. And the, the instinct was to add works. Every group was being attacked by the Jews and saying, you've got to add works. So they were buying in. They say, these people must know. And so they say, you have to have works added to salvation. But then the church at Jerusalem comes together to consider the matter. And they're going to put a stamp on one word that is going to settle the means of salvation for all generations, for all people. And that word is grace. They're going to stamp the word grace right on the Bible and settle the matter of works versus grace for salvation. Knowing that, we come to verse 19 and the Bible says, Wherefore my sentence is this, that we trouble them not, which from among the Gentiles are turned to God. Now, what we find is the beginning of the discussion and the conclusion of the matter. He says, my sentence is this, and it was essentially, we do not add works to salvation. Salvation. We find scripture giving us this principle. Ephesians chapter 2. For by grace are you saved. Let's try to say it together if we may, please, all right? For by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God. Important verse 9, not of works, lest any man should boast. It's made very clear in the Bible, okay? If grace is by works, then it is no more grace. That's what Paul concluded. And so we come here and we're going to find three characters that we're going to look at. One is Peter, okay? He's the gospel superstar. He's the most prominent person in Christianity, especially in Jerusalem. And then we have Paul. He's the up-and-comer. He's the guy that's probably most known among Gentile nations, okay? And so he's going out. He's the missionary. He's the loose cannon. He's the, he's the guy that's upsetting the apple cart, okay? And then we find James. And James is the one who said, my sentence is. Now, James at this time is going to be the pastor of the church at Jerusalem. And so they had a discussion. Peter got up, the, well, excuse me, the Jews got up and offered their contrary opinion. Peter got up and then Paul got up and then James said, here's the conclusion. Okay. Somebody said, I appreciate all the discussion, but here is the conclusion. And he did so by quoting the scriptures, turning to the Bible, and letting the Bible defend itself. And that's what all of God's people ought to stand by. Amen? Come on now. God's people ought to stand by, right? Well, that's, that's pitiful. All right. So we're going to come back, if we can, and we see here in verse number one. The problem presented... They said at the end of the verse, except you be circumcised after the manner of Moses, you cannot be saved. Okay. Now, what came after ye and before be saved? Cannot. Meaning it's an impossibility. That's what they were saying. They said without works, it's an impossibility. The Bible says now in verse number five, but there rose up certain of the sect of the Pharisees, which believed. Now, remember, 
they were believers. It says Pharisees which believed. These are converts, may, very likely of Christ or maybe even of Peter himself. I don't know. But that early church, Pharisees that believed. Now they were trained up in the law of Moses. And this is how works begin to creep its way into salvation. Because they could not get past the law, they had to infuse the law into salvation. But Paul made the conclusion that, that we are no longer under law, we're under grace, okay? So, Peter stands up, they come in verse number five, there rose up certain of the sect of the Pharisees which believed, saying that it was needful to circumcise them and to command them to keep the law of Moses. Now, notice that word keep. And notice when the act of circumcision or the work took place, it was after salvation. So were they talking about works to gain salvation? Or were they also talking about works to maintain salvation? You see, they were adding both of these. They said they've got to keep the law of Moses, meaning you've got to keep doing the law of Moses. You have to keep obeying. And if you don't obey, then you're out. Now, when you get saved, do you become a child of God? Isn't that the way it works? You are a child of God two ways. Number one, you're born again. And number two, you receive the adoption of saints. Can you imagine, I mean, that's your daughter, right? Sitting right there beside you. Disown her right now. Okay, see, she, she did what her pastor said. That's the way it's supposed to work, you know. Um, and so, now, if you disowned her right now, does that make her not your daughter? She ever talk back to you? Not very often. Does that make her not your daughter? Was it sin? Well, didn't that make her not your daughter? If you wanted to get rid of her, could you? You've tried for years. No. What am I getting at? The same analogy can be made to us as God's children. Just because we talk back doesn't mean I'm no longer God's child. Just because I violate his commandment does not mean that <laughs> I'm no longer his child. I've been trying to get David out the door out on time for years, but he's still my bouncing baby boy. You see, there's a principle here that they were not just saying you have to do this to get it. They're saying you have to keep this to maintain it. That's a bigger issue. So, we come on. Peter stands up. Why Peter? Peter was the apostle that preached at Pentecost. He was the apostle that were seeing people saved throughout and God using him in a great way. Verse 7, then, and when there was much disputing, Peter rose up. Why Peter? If Paul rose up, they would have continued the argument. Paul was an enemy at the church at Jerusalem, was the outsider, was not accepted. Peter was accepted in the room. He stood up and people began to listen. That's a lesson in exercising your influence. Sometimes you're the only one that can have influence in that room and you need to utilize that. Peter rose up and said unto them, men and brethren, you know how that a good while ago, he said, you know, you know this. A good while ago, God made choice among us that the Gentiles by my mouth should hear the word of the gospel and what's that next word? Believe. What did Paul say? Faith cometh by hearing, hearing by the word of God and salvation is by grace through faith. That not of yourselves, it's the gift of God. He made it very plain. That faith leads to our salvation. And so the act of God here is the following. Peter said, I gave the gospel and they believed. You guys are just going to have to face facts. He gives the example. He said, I gave them the gospel. You want to argue with me? That was, that was it. Somebody was arguing with me one time at the fair about cattle. And I said, of the two of us in this conversation, who do you think the odds are are right? He said, do you have them in your living room? Do you have them in your backyard? 
said, no. I said, well, since we're the one with the trailer and the rope halter and the animals, let's assume that I'm on the right on this one. Peter had authority. He was able to stand up. He was able to speak. He had that message. And so he says in verse number eight, and God. He says, you know my story and God now, God lending an unquestionable authority which knoweth the hearts, bear them witness. He said, I'm telling you that God gave his blessing to them trusting Christ as their Savior. He gave them the Holy Ghost even as he did unto us. Now, isn't that how you hath he quickened? How does he quicken us? He makes us alive by the indwelling Holy Spirit that comes to live inside of us. And now my body is a temple of the Holy Ghost. I'm a habitation of God. I have Christ in me. And now the Bible teaches that God gave his blessing to this. One thing for Peter to stand up and say, this is what I saw happen. It's another thing altogether for him to say, and God gave his blessing to it. God expected nothing more of this. Can you imagine all those Jews that were listening? I'm sure they anticipated Peter was going to stand up and tell this young Paul what was going on. Instead, he stood up and said, guys, I've seen God work in this life. I've seen God give them the Holy Spirit. I've seen them respond to the gospel and God knows their hearts. Do you know someone's heart? How have you ever known somebody, what's the, the term? That's fake. You ever know anybody that's fakey? Have you related to anybody that's real fakey? I am. Ugh. How are you? You don't get that excited when you see muffins. You know? Don't put a show on. You don't know my middle name. Unless you know my middle name, you're probably not going to be real excited. Do you know my middle name? No, he doesn't. So he doesn't care whether he sees me or not. See, the Bible says in verse 9, he gives a directive, put no difference between us and them. That's an earth-shattering statement from Peter. Put no difference between us and them. At this point, think of how God has spoken of the children of Israel. They were the children of Israel. They were the apple of his eye. They were a precious that Jerusalem was his chosen city I mean think of how elevated they were with Abraham they'd received the promise with Moses and and uh, with uh, David the covenants and all these things that God has done they're the ones that had the prophets they're the ones that knew the Messiah was coming they're the ones that received the law and now Peter says they're no different than us that was defeating to those who were sure that works was the key, I'm sure. But the Bible says, he said, in verse 9, put no difference between us and them, purifying their hearts by faith. Now, therefore, here's the question. Why tempt you God? Why are you testing God and making him prove their salvation to you? You know, that's what works is all about. It's somebody proving their salvation to you. Do I have to prove myself to you? I don't have to prove myself to you, do I? Do I have to answer to you? We shall all give an account of ourselves to Carolyn Bishop. Is that what the Bible says? That's who I'd like to have judged because she'd probably let you get away with a lot more, I'd say. <laughs> Why is that? Can I be fair? Can I be fair all the time without, I can't, can I? Can I do my best? Can God be fair at all times? Here's how he did that. He took out works and he made it by grace through faith alone. He said, don't tempt God. Don't, don't, don't test God and make him prove. He said, why would you put in verse 10 a yoke of the disciples which were neither our fathers nor we were able to bear? He said, guys, you're not good enough to be saved. You know what I've learned about people that are convinced that other people lose their salvation? They're convinced that other people lose their salvation. They sin every day, but they're never willing to accept that they've lost theirs. It's always the other person. Those folks over there, if one minor sin can separate me from God, 
then every moment of the day I would have to keep returning back to that well of salvation. But folks, we do stay in that well of salvation, but we're drawing daily from everlasting life and that living water that we never thirst and that living bread that we never hunger and that life that is now given to us because our life is now in Christ. We come back to him and this is Peter's statement. He says, here's the conclusion, guys. This is what I say in verse 11. We believe that through the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, we shall be saved even as they. He said, that's it. He said, by grace, we shall be saved even as they. Meaning, you know what? That circumcision that you have and that law that you've kept, that hasn't saved you any more than any other good deed. Sometimes you say things repeated, 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 but you know, singing in this choir does not give evidence or does not make a person saved. Giving in an offering doesn't make a person saved. Making a Christmas ornament, giving it to a neighbor, that does not make a person saved. Singing a hymn or, or being a part of some ministry or teaching a class, there is no work that lends to our salvation. The only work that is required for our salvation is the work that is already completed by Christ on the cross. And that's where you say, amen. If not, it's an uneven playing field. How many of you had, had trouble winning the quiet prize when you were in elementary school, first, second, third grade? You had trouble winning that. I did. You know, there were times that I really deserved it because the amount of quietness that I just had was a miracle. And some girl that liked to read books always got it because whenever there was any free time, she'd sit there, cross her legs, pull out her book, and read Charlotte's Web. And I looked over at my buddies and said, hey, I got a football. Or I'd throw an airplane. Or I'd say, hey, <laughs> what are we going to do at recess? You want to swap out your Doritos for my apple? How many of you are like that? I mean, really, you being quiet in class was really a miracle in and of itself. I didn't understand why. I all for the conversation. You know, that quiet seat prize is never unfair. How have you had a, had a kid that always got picked because they were the teacher's pet? And you knew what they really were when the teacher wasn't looking. You knew what they were. And Dawn's laughing. <laughs> She's like, I got 12 of them. You know, works is always unfair. How many of you have ever been in a job when somebody else received credit or received an unnecessary promotion that should have gone to you, but it ended up going to somebody else because they, uh, you know, kissed up? Yeah. Works aren't fair. It's in the eye of the beholder. Peter said, here's what we're going to do. We're going to declare that this is by grace because it's the evidence that I've seen of God. And then, Je and then Paul stands up in verse number 12, then all the multitude kept silence. Now Paul could not have silenced the crowd, but Paul took advantage of a silenced crowd. He said, well, if nobody else is going to talk, I will. I'm going to fill this void. And he stands up and he begins to speak and he gave audience to Barnabas, uh, uh, and uh, Paul declaring the miracles and wonders that God had wrought among the Gentiles by them. I want to read through some of them just real quickly. Now you can try to follow along, but you probably won't be able to. Chapter 13, they start their missionary journeys. Verse number five, he said, I recounted how we preach the word of God. Verse 16, he said, ye that fear God give audience. He said, I'm telling you, there are people out there that fear God. Verse 26, he said, to you is the word of this salvation sent. Meaning in a Gentile world, I'm telling you, you that the word of salvation has come to you. Verse number 20, or verse 32, it says, we declare unto you glad tidings. Have you ever shopped at glad tidings as a kid in Portsmouth? Yeah. It was named after this passage. He said the glad tidings. They received the good news. They were told what God was able to do. And now the Bible tells them in uh, 
chapter 13 and verse 42. He said, the Gentiles besought that these words might be preached. He said, they were hungry. They wanted to hear it. You may not think they deserve it, but I'm telling you, they wanted to hear about Jesus Christ on the cross. They wanted to hear about an empty tomb. Verse 44, the next Sabbath, he said, I'm telling you, came almost the whole city together to hear. He said, there are people coming in mass to hear the gospel, guys. And they are getting saved. You can try to add works if you want, but I'm telling you, I left cities like Lystra and Derby and Tyre and Sidon. I've left those cities and I've seen God save lives. You can question their salvation if you want, but I'm declaring unto you that all God has done. You see, Peter was a man that stood up. Paul was a man that stood out. James was the guy that brought an end to the conversation. He was a man that stood alone. Verse 13. After they had held their peace, Paul and Barnabas were done. James answered saying, men and brethren, hearken unto me. The conversation was going on, people going back and forth. I imagine there was much to offer. He came to the spot where he said, all right, guys, that's enough. Now listen. He was the pastor at this church. He said, here's the final conclusion. Here's the thing that we're going to draw to an end and we're going to pull that string in and say, this is the doctrine that will establish the foundation of our church and denomination after denomination and false prophet after false prophet has been trying to undermine the grace of God for centuries. We can all come back to the very first conference of the church. He says in verse 14, Simeon, that's Simon, hath declared how God at the first did visit the Gentiles to take out of them a people for his name. He did not reference Paul, interestingly enough. But he did go back to Peter. I don't know if he was neglecting Paul. I don't know if he was overlooking Paul. I don't know if he thought that Paul was going to hinder the argument. But we do know that he came to, uh, and he said, Simeon, Simon, Peter. But he didn't take his word on the matter because he'd been a little time in his Bible and he opened his Bible up to Amos. And in verse number 15 of, of chapter 15 and verse 15, he begins to quote it. He says, and to this agree the words of the prophets. Now, those of you, we've gone through philosophy of ministry class. There was a very first verse that we went through and it was in uh, Corinthians. It says, the spirits of the prophets are what? Subject to the prophets. So it didn't matter how logical it was for Peter to make an argument if it didn't line up with the Bible. Did it matter? No. Did it matter how much sense it made in Paul's mind if it didn't line up with the Bible? We have a world that are convinced that works are necessary to gain salvation. We have a world that it makes perfect sense to that works are necessary to keep and maintain their salvation. But we have the word of God that says differently. Yes, there, I, a man talked to me one time. We were looking at cattle and, and we were standing out at his farm. And he said, he said, I've got to talk to you about something. He said, let's just say. I said, oh boy. He said, let's just say. This guy grew up in church and, and he was saved and he was baptized and, and he was in the choir and he was teaching and, and then all of a sudden his wife left him and he got out of church and, and he's away from God. And, and all that. He said, do you really think that person's still saved? I said, well, one question we may ask is if a person is comfortable in sin, were they ever saved to begin with? But if a person is miserable in their sin, I'd say they very likely were saved because there's a Holy Spirit that is convicting us. There's a Holy Spirit that is reminding us of our necessity to trust Christ as our Savior and keep our salvation in Him and Him alone. Peter put it this way when he wrote in 1 Peter, we are kept by the power of God, not by the deeds of man. That's what he's trying to establish. The Bible says in verse 16, And this I will return and will build again. This is Amos chapter 9, verse 11. I will return and will build again the tabernacle of David, which has fallen down. will build again the ruins thereof, and I will set it up, that the residue of men, that's group number one, have this goal, 
might seek after the Lord. But then there's a second group. And all the Gentiles upon whom my name is called, saith the Lord, who doeth all these things. He said the Jew and the Gentile. You know what they just found out? It was God's eternal plan that salvation be to every person in the world by grace in Jesus Christ. Verse 18. This is known unto God are all his works from the beginning of the world. He said nothing has changed about God. We're just finally understanding how God is working in the world. You confused by the world around you right now? <laughs> Amen. You know what? It's just because we don't understand what God is doing. We know what the world is doing. Evil men and seducers shall wax worse and worse, deceiving and being deceived. And there's persecution and perilous times. But the Bible teaches us that from the beginning of the world, God had a plan. We understand it. We began to see a measure of illumination and revelation about what God has done. And so he comes to the conclusion in verse 19. My sentence is this. You know what he did? He came back and said, let's just agree with God. We're going to see they have that next week, God willing. He said, let's just agree with God. You may struggle saying, am I good enough? Short answer to that is no, none of us are. But the reality is we are all equally unworthy if it weren't for Jesus Christ. Does it matter how good I am when it comes to salvation? Does it matter how good he was? Absolutely. Saved by grace, through faith, that not of ourselves, it's a gift of God. That was a battle going on in Acts chapter 15. And that was a battle that was settled in the scriptures for all time. Salvation is by grace, through faith. Pray together, may we? Lord, I pray that you'll encourage each person and help us to be settled in the simplicity that our Savior is enough. It made sense to expect things of people. And we should, following their salvation. But Lord, we have to rest easy and simply in the knowledge that my faith in Jesus Christ is enough. In Jesus' name, amen. Stand if we may, please. Our heads bowed. How do you know that you, you struggle or you know folks that struggle with that constant battle of being good enough? Just slip your hand up. Being good enough. God is no respecter of persons. And what God is asking each of us to accept is that salvation is by grace through faith. Folks, all it takes is what Jesus Christ is in you. If God's dealt with your heart and say, well, we do, typically there's a verdict. We don't have as much of a verdict as we would today in a normal spent message. But this is something that we have to settle ourselves on. The grace of God in Jesus Christ. Lord, send us on our way confident that your grace is sufficient. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Folks, God bless you as you go.